Alhamdulillahi amma ba'd. Respected brothers and sisters, I welcome you on behalf of the masjid to this series of lectures in the blessed month of Ramadan in which every Saturday in the week uh, a guest speaker is invited and he is going to explain and drive benefits from a particular surah in the Quran. And this first lesson is going to be the tafsir of Surah Al-Furqan, delivered by our brother Ustad Muhammad Hudayfa, Ibn Sheikh Shafiq Rahman. Um, so, without further ado, I leave it to the, to the Ustad. Which is Akmalah Khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Nabiina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Alhamdulillah. We are in the month of Ramadan. And if you look into the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses Ramadan, in fact, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces Ramadan to us, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduce Ramadan? When you introduce somebody, then you generally introduce them with those characteristics which are the most noble of characteristics. That this person, his occupation is that he's a doctor or something along those lines. Or he is the son of so and so. So likewise in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he introduces to us the month of Ramadan, how does Allah introduce Ramadan to us? How does Allah define the month of Ramadan to us? What does he mention about the month of Ramadan? And it's a very famous ayah that we hear every single year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن. That the month of Ramadan is the month where the Quran was revealed. Allah decided to introduce the month of Ramadan to us by mentioning one of the greatest things that takes place or that took place in the month of Ramadan, which is that it was that the Quran was revealed during this month. And not only that, if you look at the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's mentioned regarding him that he was Ajwadun Nas, the most generous of people. But when was he the most generous? In the month of Ramadan. And why? Hina Yalqahu Jibreel. When he would meet Jibreel Alayhi Salam. Okay, when would he meet Jibreel? وَذَلِكَ فِي كُلِّ لَيْلَةِ Every single night in the month of Ramadan. Okay, what would he do with Jibreel alayhi salam in every night of the month of Ramadan? فَيُدَارِسُهُ الْقُرْآنِ He would revise the Qur'an with Jibreel alayhi salam. Every single night in the month of Ramadan, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would revise the Qur'an, recite the Qur'an to his teacher, the best of the angels, Jibreel. Showing that the month of Ramadan is not just the month of fasting, but it's also the month of fasting and the month of the Quran. It's an opportunity for us to get closer to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to recite more of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ponder and to contemplate what Allah has said in His Quran. And the ulama they mentioned that when Allah says Shahru Ramadan Aladhi Unzila fihi al Quran, that the month of Ramadan is the month which the Quran was revealed, it shows us two things. It shows us firstly how great the month of Ramadan is because of the fact that the Quran was revealed in that month and it wasn't revealed in the other months initially. And secondly, it also shows us that the month of Ramadan is the best month for us to get closer to the Book of Allah. To get closer to the Quran, to get closer to the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And getting closer to the book of Allah is not just by reciting, even though that's one of the best actions that a person can do. And for every letter that he recites, he gains 10 rewards. But that's, that's not the reason why the Quran was revealed. It wasn't re revealed just for it to be recited. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ That is book that we brought down. It's a blessed book. Why have you brought it down? لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ So that we can ponder over its ayat. 
We can ponder, we can do tadabbur, contemplate what Allah has said to us in the Quran. And some ulama have defined tadabbur, and they've said tadabbur means al-amal, action. Because if a person ponders over the book of Allah, what does that lead to? It leads to a person acting upon it. And this is how the Salaf, rahimahumullah, wa, Abu Abdurrahman al-Sulami, rahimahullah, as narrated in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, he says, كَانَ الَّذِينَ يُقْرِئُونَنَا الْقُرْآنَ Those who used to teach us the Qur'an, and he mentioned Ibn Mas'ud, he mentioned Uthman, and he mentioned others from the companions, radiallahu anhum. كَانُوا يَحْفَظُونَ عَشْرَ آيَاتِ They would memorize ten ayat. So that's their reading and that's their memorization. But then he says, and then they would not move on to the next ten ayat until they would understand what is in those ten ayat and they would act upon those ten ayat. So understanding and action. And once they had understood and once they had acted upon those ten ayat, only then they would move on to the next set of ten ayat. And that's what Abu Abdul Rahman at the end of the narration he says, فَتَعَلَّمْنَا الْعِلْمَ وَالْعَمَلَ جَمِيعًا We would learn knowledge and action together. They would come hand in hand. That's why you would see that when a command came, the Sahaba were the first people without any hesitation, without any delay. سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey and they would implement the Qur'an. Whereas us, we read, we hear the reminders, we know what's inside of the Qur'an, but we are negligent when it comes to the Qur'an. So that's why it's a really good initiative that the lectures chosen to take place in the month of Ramadan are to do with the book of Allah, to do with the Qur'an. And it's sometimes very saddening that those people who shout Qur'an was Sunnah, that we follow the Qur'an and Sunnah, when it comes to actually reciting the Qur'an, they don't know how to recite the Qur'an. Or if they know how to recite the Qur'an, ask them, how much of the Qur'an do you actually recite on a day-to-day basis? And the answer is a very embarrassing answer. But maybe sometimes they don't even recite the Qur'an the whole week and only on Friday when Surah Al-Kahf, then that's when they recite the Qur'an. And some people, not even that. And then if they do recite the Qur'an, how much of the Qur'an do they actually understand? When the Imam's reciting in Taraweeh, how much of the Qur'an do you understand? No one's asking for you to tell us the khilaf and what Ibn Mas'ud said and what Ibn Abbas said and what this person said about the ayat. Just what's the general meaning of the ayah? You know, there's over 6,000 ayat in the Qur'an. Only 500 of them are to do with ahkam, fiqhi rulings. The remainder, okay, let's say maybe a few more which are a bit more technical. That means at least 5,000 ayat of the Qur'an are that which are clear cut. That which just by reading, you understand what it means. You don't need somebody to give you an in-depth explanation. But how many of us actually know what it means? When we recite Surah Al-Fatiha, how many of us actually contemplate what we are reciting in Surah Al-Fatiha? Those ayat, those seven ayat that we repeat every single day, how many of us actually know what that means? Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas, how many of us actually know what that means? In fact, when the Quraysh, when they sent one of the ambassadors to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they went and they commanded him to go and negotiate with the Prophet. So he went to him and he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, let me speak first, and then after I've finished, you can speak. The Prophet agreed. So this person, he started, he had his own poetry that he had made and he recited his lines of poetry. He finished, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, you finished? He said, yeah. What was the reply of the Prophet ﷺ? Was it a long speech with all these technical terms and making it, trying to seem like he's, you know, got knowledge and he suffices with the Book of Allah. And what did he recite from the Book of Allah? قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ وَقُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Just these two surahs. And these two surahs were so powerful that the one sent by the Quraysh from the most eloquent of them who was sent as the ambassador to speak to the Prophet and negotiate with him. When he went back to his people and they asked him, what happened? He said, I heard a speech today that I've never heard anything like before. And I did not know how to respond. Imagine that the most eloquent of person, he went, he had Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas and he didn't know how to respond. This is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the speech of Allah. And as the Prophet ﷺ said, the difference between the speech of the Creator and the creation is like the difference between the Creator and the creation. And if you come to Surah Al-Furqan, Surah Al-Furqan, which starts at the end of the 18th juz of the Quran and finishes in the beginning of the 19th, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the word Furqan, the criterion. This is one of the names of the Quran actually. That the Quran, Al-Furqan, يعني يفرق بين الحق والباطل. It differentiates between that which is the truth and the, that which is falsehood. And in the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or for the majority of the surah, Allah talks about the characteristics and those people who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mushrikun and so on. And from those ayat in the beginning of Surah Al-Furqan, which is found in, actually in the first page or the second of the 19th juz, the Prophet sallallahu he will be complaining to Allah on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِي The Messenger of Allah would say, O oh my Lord, verily my nation, my people, يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا My people have migrated away from the Qur'an. Mahjura, they have done hijrah from the Qur'an. They have completely abandoned the Qur'an. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he comments on this ayah. And he mentions what it means to neglect the Qur'an and abandon the Qur'an. He says they don't recite the Qur'an. They don't memorize the Qur'an. They don't ponder over the Qur'an. They don't act upon the Qur'an. They don't seek, they don't use the Qur'an as a cure. Because the Qur'an is a cure for our physical illnesses and for our spiritual illnesses. All of these things, whenever they need a ruling, they don't go back to the Qur'an. Whenever they talk about love in the Qur'an, they don't actually get up and actually read and recite the Qur'an. All of this, all of these different forms come under being negligent of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I said, one of the meanings of tadabbur, of contemplating the Qur'an, the ulama use it as a synonym for action. So we need to ask ourselves, for example, this ayah, what action can we take from this? Or in other words, we ask ourselves, what is Allah asking for us? What is Allah asking from us to do from this ayah? If Allah is telling us that the Messenger وسلم, will complain to Allah and say that my people have neglected the Qur'an, then it's obligatory upon us to not neglect the Qur'an. And ask ourselves, how can we not be neglectful of the Qur'an? And if you carry on going to Surah Al-Furqan, you come right to the end. The last passage of Surah Al-Furqan, Allah changes the subject matter from talking about the mushrikun and the kuffar. And He talks about the believers. He talks about the slaves, the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He mentions... Eight characteristics of the slaves of Ar-Rahman, of the Most Merciful, i.e. Allah. And a way to answer that question, what does Allah want from us, is that Allah mentions these eight characteristics. We need to make sure that we beautify ourselves by implementing these, each of these eight characteristics. And what I want from everyone, inshallah, I'm going to give everyone one minute to either get a physical copy of the Qur'an, a mushaf, or pull out the Quran on your uh, on your phone so that you can follow along with the ayat that we will be going through, inshallah. So if you all open to Surah to Al Furqan, with chapter number twenty-five, if you go right to the end. Go to ayah number 63. Go to ayah number 63. If you found it and the person next to you hasn't helped them out, help them finding it, inshallah. If you can get those musahif, those Qur'ans that have the English translation, that'll be good as well, so you can understand what's being read as well. Got it, Musaf? Go, 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 get Quran. Go, go back. Surah Al-Furqan, chapter 25. Then go right towards the end. 
ayah nombor 63. In this passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions the characteristics of His slaves. And then right at the end, He finishes off by mentioning the reward of those people. The first two words Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He starts off with is, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ The slaves of Ar-Rahman. The slaves of the Most Merciful. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes the believers and He refers to them as slaves. And I remember one sheikh mentioning that he was giving a khutbah once. And in the khutbah he said, O oh, slaves of Allah. And then he carried on mentioning you know, whatever he was talking about. So after the khutbah, some people came up to them and said, Sheikh, very good khutbah, but don't call me a slave. I'm not a slave. And they got really offended by being called a slave. And obviously, the, from one aspect you understand why, is because of the Western understanding of the word slave then, you know, it has all of these negative connotations that Islam does not come with. But the reality is, when we say the shahada, what do we say? Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. The word abd. We, we say that we testify there's no deity worthy of worship and truth except Allah and that Muhammad is the slave of Allah and his messenger. And in fact, this is something when the Prophet you know, he rebuked the companions when they didn't use this uh, type of wording. One time, the companions, they overpraised the Prophet And the Prophet ﷺ did not like it. So what did the Prophet say to them? He said, لا تطروني كما أطرت النصار بن مريم Don't overpraise me. Just like the Christians have overpraised Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. Because if they've raised Isa alayhi salam and placed him on a pedestal that Allah has not sent him. They have called him, some, call, some of the Christians call him God and they worship him and so on. And some say he's the son of Allah. Whereas Isa alayhi salam was sent as a prophet and messenger. So the Christians overpraised Isa alayhi salam. So the Prophet is saying, don't do the same thing that the Christians have done, don't do that with me. And then the Prophet he says, Innama ana abd. Verily I am a slave. Faqulu, so say, Abdullahi wa Rasulu. So they say that Muhammad is the slave of Allah and his messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best description that we can give of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is calling him Abdullah wa Rasul. Because this is what he's commanded us to do. And the reality is, is that everyone is a slave in one way or another. Like in Surah Al-Furqan, what does Allah say? أَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَاهُ Have you seen the one who takes his own desires as his deity? Have you seen the one who worships his own desires? So a person may think he's free doing whatever he wants, in reality, he's become a slave to his own desires. Whereas in reality, those who will be successful in this life and in the hereafter are those who accept the fact that they are slaves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look, when we say Abdullah wa Rasulullah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave of Allah and his messenger, this means two things. Firstly, he was the best slave of Allah, i.e. the best worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Aisha radiallahu anha, she, she narrates that the Prophet ﷺ would stand so long in salah that his feet would start to swell. So the Prophet ﷺ was asked by Aisha that why are you doing all of this ibadah, all of this worship and Allah has, has forgiven your past sins and your future sins? You know, we understand if you're a sinner, you need to worship more. But your sins have been forgiven. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, أَفَلَا أَكُونَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Should I not be a grateful slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the Prophet ﷺ was the best of worshippers. 
And the second benefit, أَنَّهُ لَا يُعْبَدْ That the Prophet ﷺ, he himself is a worshipper of Allah, meaning he is not worshipped. Rather we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't worship the Prophet ﷺ. When it comes to any righteous person, whether a prophet or righteous person, you have three types of people. You have two extremes and then you have those in the middle. One extreme, they go overboard. Right? Raise them above the rank that Allah has sent them with. They worship them, they ask them, over praise them and things like that. And on the other extreme, you have those that don't have any respect for them. They don't follow them. They don't speak about them in good and so on. But then you have those in the middle. Those who respect them, placed, uh, uphold their rights. If they're a prophet, then we say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we follow their sunnah and so on. But then we don't over praise them. If they're a righteous person, then we don't make them infallible. If they say something, it's not the Qur'an, we have to look, is it in accordance with the Qur'an and Sunnah for us to accept it or not. And if they are a prophet, then we don't raise them and put them at the same level as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah is the creator, and they at the end of the day are still the creation, even though they are the best of the creation. So Allah calls us slaves, ibad. And then he says, ibad rahman the slaves of the most merciful. Notice how Allah Describes so people they think of slaves and they think negatively, but Allah is saying is that you He's saying that you are the slaves of the most merciful. Ah, himself. The other ayah. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَى أَنفُسِهِمْ O oh, my slaves. Look at Allah. Look how He addresses us. My slaves. My slaves who have transgressed the boundaries. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله. Do not despair from the mercy of Allah. إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا. Verily, Allah forgives all sins. إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. Verily, Allah is all forgiving and all merciful. But look how Allah describes us, my slaves. And especially here when Allah says Ibad rahman the slaves of the most merciful. Ya subhanAllah, that shows us firstly it's a mercy. It's from the mercy of Allah that He has made us from His slaves. And that we have not turned around and become slaves of other than Him. We have not become slaves of shaitan. We have not become slaves of our desires. We have not become slaves of society. But we are the slaves of Allah. And secondly, through this ibadah, this worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we hope for the mercy of Allah because He is Ar-Rahman. And as He says, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ My mercy has encompassed everything. Allah is the most merciful. More merciful than even a caring mother with a child. Allah is more merciful than her. So these slaves of the most merciful, what are their characteristics? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions eight characteristics of these people. The first characteristic, if you go back to the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Allah, He says, and the slaves of Ar-Rahman. Al-Ladheena. They are those. And are the first characteristic. The first characteristic Allah says regarding in the Quran. They are those who, work, who walk upon the earth out of humbleness and in humility. And when the ignorant people address them, they say peace. Therefore we can summarize the first characteristic of the slaves of Ar-Rahman is that they are those who have humbleness and humility and dignity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his slaves. So they have dignity and humbleness and humility with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the other slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alladheena yamshuna ala al-ardi hawna. Those that walk Upon the earth out of humbleness. This is both physically, i.e., when a person walks, he does not walk in a boastful manner, but he walks in a humble manner with humility, like the Prophet. 
And somebody may say, but doesn't it say in some narrations that the Prophet would walk with, uh, with strength and he would have a firm, strong walk? That does not negate being humble. Some people think walking humbly means that a person walks like an old man. And alhamdulillah, I'm not referring to anyone here. No, nobody looks old here, alhamdulillah. But that, these are two separate things. Walking out of humbleness and humility does not negate, doesn't mean you have to walk slow. And it, these are two separate things. You can have a fast walk, you need to go somewhere. For example, you need to be somewhere, so you walk a bit fast. Does that mean you're arrogant whilst you're walking just because you're walking fast? No, they're two separate things. So walking upon this earth out of humbleness means physically walking like that. And secondly, also in our actions and our attitude with others. That we're roaming around the earth thinking that we are better than others. Because if some people think we're better than others due to the wealth that we have accumulated or due to the status that I have had, that I've been given. And all of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not you. It's not something that you have attained. In fact, in some ahadith, Prophet mentioned that the one who says, هَذَا مَالِي وَرِثُهُ عَنْ أَبَائِي That this is my wealth that I've attained or I've taken from my parents. This is a form of shirk. It's not your money. It's Allah that he has given to you. And when you pass away, Allah will take you back. It's not going to go with you in your grave. And it's not going to benefit you. And Allah says, Surah Isra, إِنَّكَ لَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضِ وَلَن تَبْلُغَ الْجِبَالَ طُولًا Then why are you so arrogant? When you, when you walk, you don't crack the earth. Nor are you as tall and as great as the mountains. You, you are a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have been placed upon this earth to worship Allah. And everything you have been given is given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He can take it away from you anytime. You know, I saw a picture once of, um, I can't remember which country it was, but there were some Arabs and they had, you know, very luxurious life. And then some trials and tribulations came, I can't remember what it was, whether it was an earthquake, whether it was natural disaster, or whether it was a war, whatever it may be, right? And they put a picture saying that just a week ago, I was from the richest of people. I had servants in the house. And now, I'm sharing tents, you know, a small tent, 10 meter by 10 meter tent, and there's 100 people in that tent. Whatever you've been given can be taken away by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why you'll find, subhanAllah, you know, if you find a homeless person and you ask them what made you become homeless, none of them would turn around and say, oh, I gave too much charity. I gave too much charity and that caused me to become homeless. No one, none, of, none of those homeless people will say that. Because the Prophet said, مَا نَقَصَ صَدَقَ مِنْ مَالِ Charity has never reduced the wealth of a person. It's most of the times those people who are always chasing money. Who are the ones that always sign for bankruptcy? They're the ones who are chasing money all the time. Why? Because your rizq is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is al-razzaq. So do not walk upon this earth with arrogance, but rather walk upon this earth with humbleness and humility. And Ibn Abbas, when he explains the word honan, which we've translated as being humble, he says, أي بالطاعتي والعفافي والتواضع He says, when you walk upon this earth, honan means that you walk with obedience. That you are constantly in a state of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, al-afaf, chastity. And thirdly, at-tawadr, as we mentioned, being humble. This is what it means to walk upon the earth, hawnan. And then Allah says, وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا That when they go past ignorant people, or when they come across them, they say salaman, they say peace. What does it mean by saying salam? The ulama say two things. Either it means you actually say assalamu alaikum to them, or they say, قَالُوا سَلَامًا يعني قَوْلًا سَالِمًا مِنَ الْإِثْمِ That you say a speech which is free from any disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I.e. you say good words to them. So this ayah is firstly, إِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ If or when this takes place. Meaning, this is not the norm of the slaves of, of uh, Ar-Rahman. That they go around looking and sitting in those majalis, in those places where ignorant people are and foolish talk is being done. But if it takes place that they do speak to you 
and they speak to you rudely, they curse you, they say something that may anger you, what should be the response? The response is either you do not continue that and you say assalamu alaikum and you go, or you say that speech which does not contain any, anything which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this can be difficult, you know, especially if you were to get heated up. But we need to remember, especially in the month of Ramadan, what does the Prophet tell telling in the hadith that if a person angers you and says foolish words to you, what should you say? Inni sa'im. I'm fasting. You know, you don't say anything which would displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is a dua, especially with the month of Ramadan being also a month of dua. And we should increase in the du'as. There are going to be a couple of du'as that I want to mention. Try to memorize these du'as. The first is a du'a in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ would say, اِهْدِنِي لِأَحْسَنِ الْأَخْلَاقِ O oh Allah, guide me to the best mannerisms. لَا يَهْدِي لِأَحْسَنِهَا إِلَّا أَنْتِ Nobody guides to the best manners except you. وَصْرِفْ عَنِّي سَيِّئَهَا And divert me away from bad manners. لَا يَصْرِفُ سَيِّئَهَا إِلَّا أَنْتِ Nobody turns somebody away and diverts somebody away from bad manners, illa ant, except you. So what's the dua? Ihdini, ihdini li ahsan al-akhlaq, la yahdi li ahsaniha illa ant, wasrif anni sayyi'aha, la yasrifu sayyi'aha illa ant. And one more time, I'm going to say it in Arabic, I want everyone to repeat it in, uh, in Arabic as well, inshallah. Okay? Ihdini li ahsan al-akhlaq, la yahdi, Come on, louder. لا يهدي لأحسنها إلا أنت واصرف عني سيئها لا يصرف سيئها إلا أنت Okay, anyone who wants to do'a later, you can come to me or someone in the masjid, inshallah, and they'll inform you of the du'a. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to the next ayah and the second characteristic of Ibad al-Rahman, and he says, وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا They are those who spend the night لِرَبِّهِمْ Before their Lord, سُجَّدًا In a state of sujood, in a state of prostration, وَقِيَامًا And standing, i.e. standing, praying, قِيَامُ الليل. So the second characteristic of Ibad al-Rahman is that they preserve their prayers generally and especially the night prayer. Especially Qiyamul Layl. And again, one excellent opportunity is Ramadan for us to implement this. When we are in the masjid every night praying Salatu at tarawih We all know the importance of Salah. And I'm not going to spend too much time on it because the lecture is not about Salah. But we all know the importance of it. And that it is the second pillar of Islam. And if a person was to leave off Salah, then some ulama would say that he's not even a Muslim. Because the Prophet said the difference between us and the disbelievers is as salah. فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كفر. So whoever leaves off the salah, he has disbelieved, he's committed kufr. So Jenny, the five daily prayers, no excuse whatsoever. We have to uphold and be steadfast upon the five daily prayers. But the true slaves of Allah are those who also wake up at night and they pray Qiyamul Layl. And Qiyamul Layl has two parts. There's a Qiyamul Layl which a person prays at night, but then there's also a concept of Al Qiyamu Bil Quran, which is establishing the Quran, also reciting a lot of the Quran in the night prayer as well. Which is Alhamdulillah what we do in Tarawih in Ramadan. And this is the best salah that a person can do after the obligatory prayers. The Prophet he says, Afdal salati ba'd al fariyadah, the best salah after the obligatory prayers. Salatul Layl, the prayer at night. And this salah, as Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ For their Lord, i.e. they pray it sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a very important condition. And one of the reasons the Qiyamul Layl is such a great or the best prayer after the obligatory prayers because normally when it's done, it's done in private. When you pray Qiyamul Layl outside of Ramadan, you pray at home, no one's there to watch, uh, to watch you. So when you are praying, even the Taraweeh prayer, or praying Qiyamul Layl by yourselves later, we have to make sure that it is done sincerely for Allah. You're not doing it so that you can say, oh, I prayed so much. Or I prayed with, with the Imam, and then later, I prayed more again. 
You're not doing it because it's a vibe that all the boys are going and you're going to pray as well. You're not doing it because your dad's telling you to go. But you do it, why? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, the third characteristic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبَلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا And they are those that say, O oh, our Lord, Divert us away from the punishment of the hellfire. Verily, its punishment is gharaman, inseparable. Meaning, you, you'll be punished and that is something that will constantly be happening and, you, happening and you will not be, there's no break from it whatsoever. The third characteristic is that they fear the hellfire. The third characteristic of Ibad rahman is that they fear the hellfire. There are so many ayat in the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I just mentioned to you, only about 500 of them are technical fiqhi rulings. The rest of the Quran is talking about the prophets, is talking about hellfire, is talking about Allah, is talking about paradise. And that's a lot of the Quran. So why isn't it when these ayat of hellfire come, we actually ponder over them? For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِنَا سَوْفَ نُصْلِيهِمْ نَارًا That those who disbelieve in our ayat, we will throw them into the hellfire. كُلَّمَا نَضِجَتْ جُلُودُهُمْ بَدَّلْنَاهُمْ جُلُودًا غَيْرَهَا Every time their skin swells, becomes black, burns and comes off, we change it and we give him new skin. Every time he thinks the pain receptors are gone and he can't feel any more pain, Allah gives him new skin. Why? Just so the person can taste that punishment again. And every time he's tasted it and the skin comes off, Again, Allah will give him new skin and he will taste that punishment again. And it will happen again and again and again. You know, just an ayah like that, just ponder. Imagine yourself if Allah was doing that to you. That should place the fear of Allah in your heart. And when Aisha radiallahu anha, she heard this ayah, or another similar ayah, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا أَتَوَا قُلُوبُهُمْ That those people whose hearts are full of fear. She asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa أَهُمُ الَّذِينَ يَشْرَبُونَ الْخَمْرِ وَيَسْرُقُونَ Are they those, and those people have this fear, are they those that drink alcohol and those that steal? And the Prophet ﷺ said, لَا يَا بِنْتَ الصَّدِّيقِ Oh daughter of a Siddiq, the daughter of Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه. No, it's not referring to those people. وَلَكِنَّهُمْ But it's referring to those الَّذِينَ يَصُومُونَ They fast. In Ramadan, we're fasting. وَيُصَلُّونَ And they pray, they pray their prayers. And they give charity. But then they are fearful that it's not going to be accepted from them. They do all the righteous deeds, but then they are fearful that it's not accepted by Allah. Imagine they're doing the actions, but they have this fear of the hellfire because they're fearful that the actions might not be accepted. Because Allah says, Allah only accepts from those that have taqwa. When a person does an action, can anyone here just say the Asr Salah that we just prayed, you had 100% khushu' and concentration from the beginning till the end? And that's why Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, he says, Al-Mu'minu jama'a ihsanan wa shafaqah. A believer, he has two characteristics. He does ihsan. He excels in the action that he is doing. He does that in the best possible manner that he can. And then, he has that fear that it may not be accepted from him. وَالْمُنَافِقْ As for the hypocrite, جَمَعَ إِسَاءَةً وَأَمْنَةً He has isa'a, evil. He does the worst of actions. 
وَأَمْنًا أَذَنْ He feels safe. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm sorted. Allah is the most merciful. Nothing's going to happen to me. And then, Hassan al-Basri recited the ayah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ هُمْ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ That those people who have the fear of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are the believers. So from the characteristics of the slaves of Ar-Rahman is that they fear the hellfire. And what is included in fearing the hellfire is fearing everything which leads to the hellfire as well. So you see something that could lead to something wrong. It could lead you to a bad path. You fear that also. And that's why, for example, the Prophet ﷺ, even at things which in of themselves might not have been shirk. Right? So for example, if a person goes to a graveyard and he prays salah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in of itself, it's not shirk because he's praying to Allah. But this is something where the sharia has been very strict with and not allowed it whatsoever. And there's so many ahadith and so many ayat prohibiting it. Why? Because it leads to shirk. Graveyard is not a place for prayer. The masjid is a place for prayer. Or in your houses. And that's how some ulama have called it. They have called it shirk because it leads to it. So anything which leads to that which is wrong, a person should also be fearful of that as well. And there's another dua, when you guys to memorize this dua as well. You might have heard it. It's mentioned normally in Witter and so on. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah. Oh Allah, I ask you jannah, I ask you to grant me paradise, wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin aw amal. And anything which draws me closer to paradise from speech and action. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ النَّارِ And I seek refuge in you from the hellfire وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ قَوْلٍ أَوْ عَمَلٍ And anything which takes me close to the hellfire from speech and action. So again, I'm going to say the dua and everyone to repeat it. اللهم إني أسألك الجنة وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ قَوْلٍ أَوْ عَمَلٍ مِنْ قَوْلٍ أَوْ عَمَلٍ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ النَّارِ وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ قَوْلٍ أَوْ عَمَلٍ Very beautiful dua. Try to memorize the dua and say that dua as much as you can. And then in the next ayah, Allah continues the same characteristics and He says, إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا Verily it is, i.e. the hellfire, a very evil Resting place and abode for those who are in there. And then in the next ayah, Allah moves on to the fourth characteristic. And He says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا And there are those that when they spend, so Allah is talking about finance now, money, they do not expend excessively nor are they stingy, but rather they are moderate, they are those in the middle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will ask us about all of the actions that we do in this life. And from the things He will ask about is our money and how we spent it. In the hadith of Prophet Wasallam, He says, لا تزول قدم عبد يوم القيامة حتى يسأل عن A person's feet, the slave's feet, will not move on the day of judgment until he is asked about a number of things. And from the things he will be asked about, وَعَنْ مَالِهِ مِنْ أَيْنَ اِكْتَسَبَهُ وَفِيمَا أَنْفَقَهُ He will be asked about his money, how he attained that money, was it halal or was it haram, and how he spent that money. Did he spend it in halal or haram? Did he spend it on that which is obligatory upon him? Did he spend on his family? Did he spend on his children's education, Islamic education and worldly education? Did he pay the yearly zakah that's obligatory upon him? Did he pray the zakatul fitr, which is also an obligation? You know, subhanAllah, show the importance of money and how Islam protects a person's money and the financial state of the Muslims is that from the pillars of Islam, as zakah. You have to give zakah. And this zakah, which is obligatory, is a yearly zakah. There's another type of zakah known as zakatul fitr that we pay at the time of Eid. It's not the, it's, this is not the pillar of Islam which is being referred to when it's talked about zakah. But it's still something which is obligatory. It is still an obligation upon us. So we need to make sure that we are in the middle. Generally, anything in the religion, 
as uh, Mutarif ibn Abdullah he said, Khairul umuri awsatuha. The best affairs of a believer, the best affairs, the best things, awsatuha. That in the middle, between the two extremes. Not going crossing the boundaries and not being negligent as well. So you got money, no problem, you can spend that money, but are we being extravagant? Are we wasting money? Are we spending it on things that we don't need? And the other extreme, being negligent. Are we paying our zakah? Are we giving charity? Are we praying zakat al fitr? Are we looking after our families? Are we looking after our relatives if they are in need? And so on. So this is the fourth characteristic. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to the fifth characteristic and he says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرَ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ Allah mentions that they are those who do not call other than Allah whilst also worshipping Allah. Nor do they kill a soul without its right, nor do they fall into zina, into unlawful sexual uh, relations. Basically, the fifth characteristic of Ibad al-Rahman is that they stay away from the major sins. They stay away from the major sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, He mentions three of the most major sins. The worst being shirk. Which is something that Allah will never forgive. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi. Allah does not forgive the one who commits shirk with him. Unless a person repents. Like the Sahaba radiya anhum. Before accepting Islam, they were upon shirk. But then they repented. And they accepted Islam. And they became from the best of, of people. But otherwise if a person dies upon shirk. Whether major or minor. Now some ulama differ regarding minor. But what, Allah still calls it shirk. And Allah says he doesn't forgive shirk. Allah doesn't say just minor or major. Any type of shirk, Allah will not forgive. And then we come to the other major sins. Killing and zina, Allah SWT mentions here. And this includes also any of the other sins as well. This doesn't mean if you stay away from this or it's allowed for you to steal. No. Any major sin, the ibad al-Rahman, they stay away from it. And, we, and Ahlul Sunnah believe on the Day of Judgment, those who commit major sins are under the will of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But we're not talking about being under the will of Allah. We're talking right now about the slaves of Ar-Rahman. How are they? How should they be? Any major sin, they should stay away. And also what is included in major sins, and it's a general principle, the ulama, they say, لا كبيرة مع الاستغفار ولا صغيرة مع الاستمرار There's no such thing as a major sin if a person sincerely repents. If you sincerely repent, Allah will forgive that sin. ولا صغيرة مع الاستمرار nor is there anything known as a minor sin if a person is consistent and persistent upon it. If you're doing that sin again and again and again and again and again and again and you're just never stopping, that's become a major sin. Because you have no fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left regarding that sin. And the ulama of hadith, to accept a hadith, when they talk about that person has to be just, uh, has to be adil, he has to be reliable. From the things they mention is that a person never commits a major sin and he's not persistent upon the minor sins. If you're persistent upon the minor sin, they will not accept the hadith from you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after mentioning this, uh, three of these major sins, he moves on and he talks about some of, uh, some of the punishment that will take place. Right? So he's not moved on to the next characteristic yet, but he's talking about the punishment. وَمَن يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا That whoever does these sins, then he will receive a penalty, i.e. a punishment. يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدَ فِيهِ مُهَانًا His punishment will be doubled on the Day of Judgment and he will remain in there forever, humiliated. إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا Except for the one who repents to Allah and those righteous actions, you sincerely repent to Allah and you are regretful of the sin that you have committed and you stay away from that sin and you make a firm intention to never do that sin ever again, Allah will forgive your sin. And not only forgive that sin, Allah says, 
أولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات. Allah will change all of those bad sins that He had and change them into good deeds. So instead of having sin, it's be it'll be replaced with with reward. وكان الله غفور رحيم and Allah is all forgiving the all merciful. وَمَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا And whoever repents and does righteous deeds فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابًا Then indeed, return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with repentance. And now Allah moves on to the sixth characteristic. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورَ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا and they are those who do, when, who do not testify to falsehood. And when they pass near ill speech, they pass with dignity. The sixth characteristic is, they don't sit in gatherings of falsehood. They don't sit in gatherings of falsehood. They are not those, they sit in those gatherings where people are gossiping. Where people are backbiting. Whether it's other Muslims, whether it's scholars, whoever it may be, they're not backbiting. They are not those people who are spreading, you know, kufr, mocking the religion, spreading innovations, deviated ideologies. And they are not those also who sit in those gatherings where time is being wasted. But there's no problem in a person relaxing maybe half an hour, you know, small little time, one hour if so. Where it's a little rest from everything so that you can go back to worshipping Allah. Or it's a means of brotherhood and sisterhood being strengthened. There's no problem with that. But then you'll find some people, every single day after taraweeh, two, three hours just wasted their time. They'll go out to eat and coming home at 3 a.m. In the month of Ramadan, that's wasting your time. So a believer is not somebody who wastes their time because Allah will ask him, uh, that same hadith, that a person's slave, a slave's uh, feet will not move on the day of judgment until he is asked about a number of things. One of those things and Umarihi fima afna, his life, his time, and how he spent it. So here and there it's okay. Or if there's a benefit coming out of it, it's okay. But if there's no benefit whatsoever, I believe it is not from those that waste his time in these um, in these gatherings. Ibn Jiri al Tabari he says, after mentioning different you know statements of the Salaf regarding this ayah, he says, Fa'ul al Aqwali bi sawabi fi ta'wilihi and yuqal. The the most the, the best way of interpreting this ayah is to say وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ شَيْئًا مِنَ الْبَاطِلِ There are those that do not sit in those gatherings where any type of falsehood is mentioned or taken place. Not shirk, not music, not lying, nothing else. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to the next characteristic, number seven. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُوا عَلَيْهَا لم يخروا عليها صما وعميانا. And they are those that when they are reminded with the verses of or the signs of Allah, they do not fall upon those signs deaf and blind. The reason you don't translate the word ayah to just verses, when you say verses, then you're limit, limiting it to the Quran. When you say ayat, ayat, an ayah is, is a sign. So it refers both to the Qur'an and also to any other form of sign of Allah. Whether it's the universal signs, just by pondering over the creation of Allah. Or whether it's even a person coming to you, reminding you about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu he says, إِنَّ أَبْغَضَ الْكَلَامِ إِلَى اللَّهِ The worst speech according to Allah, أَنْ يَقُولَ الرَّجُلْ لِلرَّجُلْ When a man says to another man, اِتَّقِ اللَّهِ Fear Allah. The person in reply, he says, worry about yourself. The worst speech that if a person comes to you saying, fear Allah, don't do this sin, a person replies by saying, that worry about yourself, don't worry about me. And so, uh, hadith authenticated by Al-Albani. Rather, when the signs of Allah, especially the Quran is being recited, we have to be attentive with the Quran. We're not playing on our phones. We're not, you know, even just doing something like this. We're not replying. We're not every person that works plus and only comes along. You just focus on the Quran. Ponder on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. And then the last characteristic Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما And there are those that say, O oh, our Lord, grant us from amongst our wives and offspring comfort to our eyes and make us leaders for the righteous. The eighth characteristic is that they make sincere dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They sincerely, they want anything in this life, they turn back to Allah. And in this ayah, or in this dua that's mentioned specifically here, notice how the word Rabb is used. The word Rabb. If you ponder over the du'as in the, in the Qur'an, <clears throat> and especially the du'as of the prophets, they all start with Rabb. They don't start with the other names of Allah. They don't start with Ya Hayy, Ya Qayyum, Ya Zal, They don't mention all these names. They mention the word Rabb. Because the word Rabb refers, means that Allah is the Al-Khaliq. He's the one that created you. He's the one that provides for you. He's the one that nurtures you physically and spiritually. He is the one that guides you. And He is the one that gives you victory. These five things that Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentions. It's basically the rububiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why it's from the best names to use when you are calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do they ask here? They ask, we ask here that oh Allah make our families, our wives, our children, the coolness of our eyes. What does it mean the coolness of our eyes? That when you look at them, your heart feels peace. And the greatest form of peace is that you see them steadfast upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what Prophet ﷺ said, وَجُعْلِيَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَةِ That the coolness of my eyes is salah, is praying. That's why I find that contentment. And then the second part of the dua, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Make us imams for those that have taqwa, for the muttaqeen. Shaykh Abdul Razak al-Badr, he has a very beautiful point when he mentions this ayah. He says, فَلَا يُمْكِنُ لِلْعَبْدِ أن يكون قدوة وإيمان إمام للمتقين بعده إلا إن كان متأسيا بالمتقين قبله. A person cannot be an imam for the muttaqin who come after him unless he follows the muttaqin who came before him. You cannot become a leader of iman and of taqwa unless you follow the imams of iman and taqwa that came before us. I.e. the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, his sahaba. And their students and their students. If you don't follow them, then you cannot be an imam for the muttaqeen that will come after. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he finishes off and he says, أُولَٰئِكَ يُجَزَوْنَ الْغُرْفَةَ بِمَا صَبَرُوا وَيُلَقَّوْنَ فِيهَا تَحِيَّةً وَسَلَامًا خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا حَسُنَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا قُلْ مَا يَعْبَأُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْلَا دُعَاءُكُمْ فَقَدْ كَذَّبْتُمْ فَسَوْفَ يَكُونُ لِزَامًا These last three ayat, I'm just going to summarize because of time. Last three ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically mentions um, that the reward for these people, the Ibad rahman is that they will be in paradise and they will remain in there forever. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people of paradise. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us firm upon his religion and to truly be from those who are considered Ibad rahman and his slaves. And allow us to beautify ourselves with these characteristics that have been mentioned in this passage, and likewise, all of the other characteristics that we mentioned throughout the uh, Quran. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make, to make us from the people of the Quran, those who recite the Quran, ponder over the Quran, and also act upon the Quran. Subhanakallahumma wa